start recording. Okay, so this is our third meeting uh, working on CDK Home documentation. So let's update the whole world, even though the whole world is not seeing this live yet. Um, but John, uh, just go over where we're at right now. I'm going to lay out where we're at and uh, lay out some tasks and, and some of the design that we're uh, collaborating on. Go ahead. All right. Sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yep. All right, so our updates are uh, mainly on the inspection and um, reaching out to some potential uh, enablers, I would call them, so like Matt Reisinger or somebody that's got a big platform, uh, tentatively scheduled to meet with him at the end of July, get the word out through his channel, give him an opportunity to um, fall in love with the project and see where that goes. Um, we continue to reach out to builders that we know, um, looking for warm introductions, looking for people to potentially fill the GC role, act as mentors, and so we're still building that network. Um, we have a, I think, temporary solution for the inspections. So uh, we've been in contact with uh, IBTS, which I believe is like International Building Trades and Standards for Safety. Something like that. Mm. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, and so we think we can get one of their inspectors on site in Maysville after the um, 11th through 15th um, finishing phase of Rosebud. Yeah, actually during it, because we're going to move, move on right to the next steps after the rough in, rough Got in it. phase, uh, ideally, hopefully. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. OK. Um, and so for today's meeting, and this is a working model as we go, you know, it, my goal is to refine this each week, get a little bit better at presenting the information. And so I've got a little agenda for today and, uh, you know, based on your feedback, Marsha, I can change it moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is just an update on where we are on the timeline. Um, we're still actively working on land acquisition, recruitment, documentation, those are the three big efforts right now. And um, at your own convenience, you can look at the days remaining. The goal of this timeline is not to like place undue pressure on all the efforts everybody's doing, but I think it is helpful to see the whole thing in context. Mm -hmm. And this is a work in progress, but just going off of the um, responses to the newsletter, I'm starting to build the different teams around different tasks and you know hopefully this will just get clearer and better as time goes on. Nice. Yeah. And so here is a um, just a, a very basic s sketch of how all of our activities sort of fit together um, and it goes chronological from top to bottom. And the goal of this picture, this table, is uh, anybody who wants an update on where we are in this process can just look at one slide and, and get a, a general sense or a general idea. Um, and these are like the big rocks. And um, as time goes on, I'll be able to expand this into a more detailed plan. But this is our foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. Oh, yeah. Uh, also on this document, um, I'm creating a space for Margin to list the priorities uh, in terms of CAD and documentation so that, you know, for those who don't attend the meetings or, or watch the recording, uh, you, can, you know where to look to find the to-do list. So over time, again, this will be refined and filled out. And, um, yep, I've already covered that. And so I think that is it for me. All right, uh, that sounds good. And this this document is still the same one linked from the before. So let me uh, precisely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let me type in this link into the chat box here. Then, which is which is the team team page, so you can take a look at this document we just we just looked at. And now I'm going to click. If I click into that same link there, I'm going to go into the technical working doc. For today, so the idea there is we talked about. I mean, you got to really review the first uh, two meetings um, and see how to see how we collaborate. But we, you know, we want to divvy out a task list. Be very specific about what tasks are 
available to be to be done. So we're doing the b both the remote work and prototyping at the same time. I mean, this is actual picture. This was like back in February. Just you know, that's the canopy over the front door. We um, can't see you. See your oh, screen. Oh, gosh. sorry about that. Talking to myself. Uh, so let me uh, share my screen here. Okay. So on my screen here. So I clicked into. So this is the team page. I mean, this is the sign up sign up spreadsheet and here's like today's this is what I'm actually looking at here so I click edit on that and it gets me into here uh, yeah so that's that's the actual house as of like right now February and and cur currently right now that we're finishing so it's always between real real prototyping CAD work which is digital means that the whole world can participate and then product build and product now product that's the the open enterprise that we're developing developing a, an apprenticeship to, to do this. So the idea is global collaboration with an intent of solving housing. What's it mean? What does it mean to solve housing? Wow, that's a big, big topic. It takes the whole world and it starts with digital collaboration like we're trying to do uh, and making this open enterprise, meaning that we can train anybody to do this. And um, basically the whole philosophy of, of open source economics, that the only way to transcend a lot of issues is by open collaboration. Okay, as far as very specific things, it gets down to the, the, the designs, the, their costs, their build and enterprises. So uh, what can we collaborate on right now? So uh, some priorities. And we talked about last meetings, we've got, um, we keep a work log as far as uh, what we actually do. Uh, you can review the former meetings. On the design, uh, we laid out in the last meeting what's to be done on the second story exterior modules, so you can review that. Uh, the point is to do CAD. There's 24 modules on the second floor. Uh, let me see if I can uh, share my some CAD here. Um, I'm gonna open up. So, so if you download the file, uh, it's gonna look like this. If you uh, within a document, you can. Uh, that uh, first floor second floor so this is this is the CAD model and and uh, on the second floor we're we review the last week's meeting you can see what we're doing and we're actually in the production model we're gonna have nine foot modules instead of eight foot modules on the second floor in order to simplify the decorative trellis that's at the top uh, you can review last meeting for that but basically these are all modules you know this is uh, you know, top plate, like this is a module, the door, and so forth. So you can strip down this model, in the second floor, into 24 modules, but each one of them has to be modified. So if you know how to do CAD, you can get involved in this. Um, so second story exterior modules, when you, these are actually broken down one by one. Um, and for example, Logan, I already saw he, he was, uh, uh, he did module number 24 which is the corner one, so he did this thing. I, I see him, Logan, contributing that since the last uh, entry, July 13 of 21. So actually about a year later, we were actually updating this after seeing the real build that's happened. Um, uh, we do, we do want to, so the second story had, uh, we do want to have a direct link yeah, I mean, you, you want to review this meeting, and it tells you where to download it. Yeah. This last week's meeting, so you can you can find all the details there. Um, now, how about bil bills of materials and costs? Well, we have the a lot of the digital model done, so there's a task there. Uh, on on task number one, there's like 24 people could do that. The first one is done. There's 24 more to be done. Um, on on the cost, we have. Uh, organize the final spreadsheet so you can click on this so if you look at this is it this is like the final final thing I called it seed home 3 uh, but what, you, what you'll see here that's that's a spreadsheet it's open editable like in this share thing you have anyone with, with the link can edit All right so what, what can happen uh, you can take our and this is broken down into a lot of things, starting with simple stuff like, okay, what do we need for the exterior wall lumber in structure and framing? Well, 
we've got a series of 20 tabs in this entire document actually which lists all the different materials the ones that would be relevant uh, would be ones that are related to material um, I can th this thing is hiding my thing here uh, foundation walls like for example walls um, <clears throat> found um, one that's important yeah, I mean, this, this is like a whole year's worth or two years worth of material here. Like in a second Menards order here, which is our local big box store, you can see like all the different, you know, all the lumber and stuff. But you can study this and uh, there's a lot of items in here that we may or may ha not have used. This is like as bought, but as bought is not as, as built. So what you do then is go to the CAD so this is for CD Cajon, this, this structure right here. Go to the CAD, download this. Um, so that's the, that's the actual file I just showed you. But you can download it like right now. You can open it up and you can start summing up the bill, bill of materials. And we talked about last week how at the end of the day, so that's for example floor one, at the end of the day we'll be able to do this automatically through the the CAD once the CAD is completely completely updated like we're updating but for now we gotta buy materials for the next one so what we can what we can do is uh, say this is module one well you can take a look at it if you recognize what this is that's two by six lumber that's nine foot and so forth so what you do is go into the, the actual spreadsheet uh, so, so this is one module uh, ideally all this, these parts would be labeled in a CAD which they're not because this is like an entire module it's just one object uh, but we're getting into the uh, making a full separated CAD so you have all the parts in there but once you can take a look at your uh, CAD and your BOM spreadsheet you can start filling in the materials I mean this is just big accounting task job but it can be broken down into very tiny tiny bite-sized chunks so like for example um, you know, for the first floor exterior wall lumber, which I just showed, well, you're going to have two by six um, pre cut studs. So you have to have so, some situational awareness. You can either study the CAD and study all the design docs we have, or if you're a builder, it's kind of much more simple to you. Like, if you have any experience with this, you, you can pretty much take the CAD and, and start extracting the bill of materials. So, what's the bill of materials do? Um, here we have, um, like as an example, uh, this is our template for a bill of materials. Uh, item definitely, okay, you want to identify what it is. Now here we typically do like this actual dimensions column because a 2x6 is actually uh, pre-cut studs. They're going to be like 1.5 inch by 5.5 inch. I just know this, but times like... Um, and these are actually nine foot pre-cut studs and all that, so I think it's like 104 and 5 eighths inches. That's an actual dimension. It's a useful thing because a lot of times this will inform you uh, if you don't know what the actual thing is. A lot of times like this, the descriptions might be not correct, so we, we like to put actual dimensions. Purpose, we're gonna say the first floor, that's important, like, because you might have this as we're counting here, we, we um, if we list this by reconciling the CAD and the, the bill of materials, it's easy just simply to go through the things and, and how they go into the entire building. Uh, like, okay, that's the first floor uh, outside walls. That's an easy way to think about it um, when you're summing it up at this phase. So you might have the same kind of, kind of material at another place, like, Second floor, yeah, we use the same materials. But here you want to just first break it down into, so you keep, keep track of everything. And then, uh, so the purpose column is, well, here you know that's the first, you kind of you kind of know this, first floor exterior wall. Um, but that's how we do it. Quantity, like, well, that's the part we have to count up. So you go around the whole cat and just start counting it up. Price, um, okay, link. So, Price, well, you don't know the price until you, s you see the link. So you probably want to put the, let's move the source 
sourcing. So all the, like right now what we could do is around here we have Menards, which is the best place. You might have Home Depot as source too, and then maybe like Lowe's or whoever your local lumber yard is. But if we go to this, um, go to say Menards, um, nine foot pre-cut stud, you can find that there. <coughs> Um, you can say, oh, okay, great, $698. Uh, now these are eight foot, so these are, we, we need the nine foot, which is this one. So you put that in there, but that's already in, a, in, in this big spreadsheet we have, it's already in there. Um, let me close down some of these files. It's all in there in a sense that, so I'm here, this is our third BOM3, right? But in all these tabs, you probably already have that link somewhere in there, so you can dig through that, or you can go back to the internet and then paste that link in there. What happened there? So that's, there it is, it's in there, source one. Uh, so for each one, whatever the price was, was like seven and so forth. So this would, um, I guess here we gotta put that. So if you got four of them, got 20 bucks. But this is gonna, we just gotta go through this and, and the number at the end should end up $60,000. Uh, but that's what we got to prove. I don't even know. Like, I mean, we've done it last year. We know materials went up. Um, so we never really, this would be like our master summary of all the parts. Um, but that's what we got to do. So that's the build materials part. And that's what we, we can do. Um, you can study the existing CAD, ex existing build materials, which are the 20 older tabs that I mentioned. And you can go from there. So there. Uh, more specific tasks. There's build instructions, but unless we have, uh, I, yeah, I mean that for that you, you typically want to have people who have done construction. But the way we do it, we typically do things like, oh, here's, uh, we probably have some existing build instructions. Like, okay, so I show the canopy here as just you know case in point. Yeah, we actually do. Like in our um, seat home two build instructions. Uh, which you access once again for review, but review the first two meetings. Uh, here's our main documentation spot. The build, the build instructions are here. So under these build instructions, I actually can find a canopy. That's one of the many, many things that are documented, right? So you go to the canopy, you can actually look at this document. This document was generated before the build, right? So this is coming from CAD, which was, this CAD happens to be in Sweet Home 3D. You can open it up if you can download Sweet Home. Um, but from that CAD, we built it up um, a, like a rough instructional. This is kind of like a cheat sheet thing. But this wasn't done until, this was all done before the build. So after the build, we got some pictures. All right, so we got some pictures. It's me like doing that uh, in, a, in a spring. And then you can actually start filling out uh, some of this this instructional with more supporting information like the pictures like as built so we can add to this Does anyone want to play with that and, and start inserting pictures into this document who wants to do it? Uh, so whoever wants to do stuff. This is how we do it uh, mark what you're gonna do and Then document in your log to give you an example. How did Logan do it? I know he did it because he actually emailed me, but he, Because he did it. He just put the link up there. Well, that's what he did. He did the FreeCAD file for module uh, 24 and stuff like that. So um, that's how we trace whoever's doing work. But if you want to take this on, then um, go uh, go ahead. So there's CAD for CAD people. There's call the build materials. I mean, that's like a big task. And you know, how do you excite somebody to do it? Well, you got to find some motivation to do it. But it's interesting because you can go study between the CAD and between the existing. Um, work that's been done in the design doc, so you can take this as a learning project if you have completely no experience. So if you want to dive into it, you're welcome to do it. And that's an invitation for the whole world because eventually you want to get a 
as we start our apprenticeship here, we'll be able to do this kind of process very effectively with much larger teams, but we're, we're just uh, shouting out loud as far as what we're doing here, so in case anybody wants to take any of these tasks on, you're welcome to do it. Uh, but that's about all, all for my side um, regarding the, what some of the specific tasks are. Uh, any questions on this? And maybe I'll, I'll go through one more thing. I'll, I'll go through, so, so these meetings are, one is a call out for specific tasks, two is going over some of the um, design details, like how off the press design details of what we're doing. And I would like to actually go over the, the photovoltaic integration into the CD home because that's gonna be a standard feature. So I'll, I can talk a little bit about that. But before I go there, um, Marchan, I yeah. have a question. Yeah. Two questions. This is Iris. Um, the first is when you did your build, did you find out that your either your bill of materials or your dimension or anything were were incorrect? And yeah. then did you circle back and have to correct that stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's a complete iterative process, and the, the okay. answer to your question is in general yes, and then. Once we built it, for example, we built the four by nine modules one time, then we know, oh, okay, we know exactly what material goes in there. But before we built it, we, it might have turned out, oh, we need to use this other material or a different length or something. So it's constantly, constantly. That's why what you're doing, what, we're, what you're seeing being done right now is, okay, for example, we had that instructional. Well, after the build, uh, whoever say puts the pictures into the design the actual instructional doc they might make some changes and it happens all the time so the answer is is yeah and we always do it now at the end of the day when you go out to the build site and expect to build it in five days at that point is where no you don't have changes it's like everything has to be pretty much ironed out because you'll never get the five days otherwise right. you have to run back to the store or do change orders um, but that's, does that answer the question? Yes. And then the second one is, how did you determine the second floor height needed to be yeah. 9 feet and not 10, which is standard, uh, well, a more standard Ten. piece of lumber? Well, actually, 8 would be probably typical, well, uh, more typical. Um, oh, yeah. But, um, right, 2x4x8 uh, by by was when we started. Uh, makes sense, but we found out that um, so if you go to actually let me share my screen uh, just to review that just to review um, but in a seat home when you see the decorative trellis it turns out that that trellis was, a, so this is once again what you said, do we find things are wrong? Well, yeah, that was a major pain to actually execute this in practice. That decorative trellis, which is built already, mm -hmm. it's in the pictures, but it turned out that when we had the eight foot walls, we had to add this very, very top section as a facade and it turned out that that just took a lot of time. Just a lot of time. You had to build up verticals and put a, put a, all the sheeting and all of that. Uh, so it's actually much easier if you make, instead of going eight feet for the second floor, you go to nine feet. And then this is an actual part of the building. You don't have to build it up anymore. And it, just the labor, amount of labor it saves is worth spending a little bit more to get instead of two by uh, two by six by eights, we get two by six by nine. So that's just one of those things that you learn, because okay. you you know when you when you do it at first, it's like oh yeah, we'll just build it up and make it. We, we save all that lumber, but then it turned out it really was uh, a nightmare in terms of the actual labor part. So that's 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 actually why we're going to the uh, nine okay. footers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there we go. Any other questions? And then people who watch this on, on the internet, on YouTube, they feel free to put the questions into YouTube. We, we, we do review these things from time to time. But let's talk, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the electrical part, because that's, um, 
that's an important thing for what we're doing. Uh, Off-grid means you're saving. If you're, if you're running everything electrical, the first part of that strategy is we can fit six kilowatts of PV panels that now cost under 50 cents a watt. So in materials for the panels, you're talking like 3,000 in materials for the panels. Now there's the racking system and balance of system, which will probably add 2,000 more. But it's a steel uh, in terms of wh whoever does this by themselves. It's, it's, panels are, solar panels are very effective these days. Um, if we do solar panels, there's different options to go in terms of grid interconnection. And there's three ways. Like one is you're off grid. That means you're not even connected to the grid. Well, if you want to sell housing to people in cities, well, typically you're not even allowed to be off the grid in a city. So just for the general use case, you want to be... Um, we want to have an option to do either grid or PV, but not like a standard. A standard grid grid tie inverter is not going to be our route. Why? Well, first is actually a good practical one: is when a grid goes down, your your PV goes down. That's what you get with a grid intertie inverter. Sorry, sucker, you have your PV, but you can't use them if the grid is down. And that's, that kind of beats the purpose of PV. If you have light and you have a power outage, uh, you want to be able to use your PV. So for us, from the usability perspective, I'm open to critique on that. Uh, but as far as we know, grid tie inverters do not allow you for reasons of safety. Because if you're running power and if the grid doesn't, if the grid intertie inverter doesn't shut down when when there's a power outage, you'd actually be posing a threat to like line workers who might be fixing that. Uh, so the industry standard is for grid tie inverters to shut down your home PV system if the power goes out. Okay, we can do better actually, and better and cheaper. So grid tie inverters are a little more expensive than the route we're doing, but what we're doing is a simple concept of a transfer switch. Um, but before you go into transfer switch, which means simply you're transferring, you can manually switch or even you can automate that, but we just manually switch when it's night, we turn to grid power, when it's day, turn on to the, to the off grid. Uh, so the other route is to go completely off grid, uh, don't have the, the grid connection. The advantage there is you save costs. Disadvantage is that you're gonna have to have a backup power, your battery, like a big battery bank. In our system, our battery bank is literally non-existent. So let's let's talk about this. It's, it's a very small one. It's not a bank it's as much as a buffer, just a buffer to make the inverter work. So I'm gonna share my screen again and, sh and um, go through a little bit of that design. Um, so what do we have? So we went to this dock. Let me shut down a bunch of stuff here. Okay. So we call it the hybrid grid inverter plus transfer switch. And this is like going off our CAD model. What do we do? So um, the explanation here is so you're going to have PV going on, on the top of the roof. And you're going to have your power wires from the PV. And we're going to aim to put this PV like a cabinet for the PV system, so that's going to be an inverter and batteries, like a battery buffer, we call it, here. Okay, now let me just back up to that, but basically the PVs from the roof go into, like, right to the, your, your PV system, like PV power panel, and then it goes to the transfer switch. What's a transfer switch? It's just this thing, it costs 200 bucks, and you switch from one power source to the other. This can handle 100 amps, our CD to home design right now is designed for a 100 amp breaker. So this works for us. Uh, so you switch from night to day between your power. Um, why do we want to do that? I, I explained the reason this is the way to do it. So in terms of layout, and this is like we're still negotiating how to lay this out, but the latest is let's, let's just put the PV system up here where it's you have to run the least amount of wires from the PV, and then from the PV system, once you, which creates, you have an inverter in there, so that creates your 240 volts AC, and then you feed it into the, the transfer switch. So from one side, you have the, the electric going into the transfer switch, 
And from another side, you have the grid power feeding into the transfer switch. Um, and then this gets spread throughout the house through your main breaker, your main breaker panel. So after this transfer switch, we're actually going into the breaker. So this is still like the supply side before you go into the breakers of the main, the main house breakers. And I'll just make a comment on how uh, we're implementing, like why this works, because I actually haven't seen anybody do it this way, but we have learned from experience. Uh, well, the, the, the controversial part being, how, do you, how are you able to run this literally without a battery bank? Well, it's not a big battery bank, it's a tiny battery bank. And, and the way it works right now for us, right now in this house here that I'm in right now, we have three kilowatts of PV and what we use is four motorcycle batteries, which are like 25 bucks each. So that's our battery bank, it's a very tiny one. But the point is that that battery bank provides enough buffer between the charge controllers and the inverter to allow you to run like an eight kilowatt inverter up to eight kilowatts. Well, you can have three with three kilowatts of, of solar, you can only get three continuous, but like peak loads of like eight, you can actually do. We have an eight kilowatt inverter for a short time. Uh, where's that energy coming from? It's actually coming from the battery. So the batteries are effectively serving as a buffer. They're not really, in the way we use them, they're not really used for storage. They're used as a buffer. And why do you even need the battery at all? Well, the way standard inverters work, or standard, uh, yeah, standard inverters need to be control, uh, connected to a, a juicy source of power like a battery. They cannot be connected in the standard kind of inverters, the cheap ones that cost like 500 bucks or so um, for like eight kilowatts. Uh, you can't charge, go directly from the charge controller to the inverter. You have to always go through batteries. So uh, the battery is effectively a buffer that gives gives the system just enough storage capacity that you can run your loads. Like for example, if there's clouds, you know, clouds might be there for like five, ten minutes or whatever. Uh, well, if you didn't have the small battery bank, your grid would go down immediately. So our experience here is that under practical conditions, when it's, when it's overcast, you still get power, so we're able to run. But sometimes it's like a heavy rain, and like literally like no sun at all. Well, those batteries will last you just for a little bit, but yeah, if you get too long of that, um, that overcastness, or s your grid would go down, your, your uh, inverter system would go down. So basically, this kind of system allows us, in practice, to have a case where either on full sun or cloudy days, uh, we can use the full power of the three kilowatts of the, the rooftop PV. Um, now note that, just another note about this buffer, this battery buffer. If you get a cloud, you can get down to like 50% or 25% of the, the power, right? So. If you're running your your house, you say you're running a heat pump, your fridge, or whatever, things that add up to like close to three kilowatts, um, you're gonna need that buffer and as much buffer as possible for you not to crash your grid, your off-grid grid. Um, does that make sense? But that's how we're, I mean, our experience, so I'm gonna go back to our meeting here, um, stop presenting. So that's, that's how we actually use the, the inverter system on this house. And it's a low cost way to do it. Uh, I think we can do this also in the CD the home, the, uh, where we have six kilowatts, you can run a very tiny battery bank. And then whenever it's night, you shut off to the grid. And if the clouds pass by and you have like less, less power, well, if it's an extended period of time, your your inverter will crash, will crash on you, and you have to turn back to grid power. But for normal circumstances, say we're using you know like a kilowatt or whatever, and the clouds come on and and you hardly have any power, you can still do that as long as you're not running too many loads in in the house. So we're designing for a system that's going to be six kilowatts continuous, and that's 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 basically it. So the expected materials cost in that entire system should be about like five thousand, six thousand bucks or so. If you're doing that yourself for an eight kilowatt, uh, sorry, six six kilowatt 
PV system. I mean, that's really dirt cheap. Like probably the normal price you'd pay for a grid tie system of that size is probably like 20k, 20,000 or so. So it's a good deal if you know how to do it. Well, you can download our plans, and once we finish this up, and we'll document it better. So yeah, but that's that's about all for today. Uh, I think um, uh, right now we're preparing for the. We're gonna next week actually in. Um, People like Iris, myself, uh, Jim, a couple of other people are descending onto Factory Farm, and we're we're actually building out the the plumbing electrical. So we're going to test out whether our crazy efficient um, build uh, is going to be realistic. A little preview on that. Let me share share my screen for just a uh, another second here. But what we'll be building out um, next week. This is this is our working dock. Um, so this, this thing, I mean, it's designed, this is like exact, exact lens and everything. So this will go, we're going to cut all these PVC tubes for our plumbing, um, for our water, uh, I'll open up what we'll be doing is, uh, this is, we're kind of like finishing up some of the details, getting all the parts, we're doing this this for the water that's that's our like water lines uh, but i mean all the details are in here like all of these things are push fit like all these things these are all push fit shark bite fittings so things go like really fast um right in pretty fast um i want to show you the actual like what it looks like we just did this let's see is it in this document electrical no it's it's this doc right here so this this is like a pretty detailed uh, plumbing design so oh yeah so like here um this so you saw that cat picture well here this is like all these um, push fit fittings like this is what we're doing and this is like a super quick way because then you cut your PEX tubing the all the water tubing um, and then you insert it it's just a push fit and it, and it doesn't come out so that's the kind of design and, and you know it looks manageable we gotta make all these quick connections you connect like these little clips connect to the stud framing um, but this entire panel of water supply starting from the street supply one inch pipe from the street uh, there's a bunch of three quarter inch packs and one half inch packs but that's what we're doing all the shark bites like this including like say the hose you know the hose bib thing for the outside that's still a shark bite fitting called a push fit fitting that's really easy so it's just cutting and inserting and it should be like I mean, our goals are to show that we can do this, this whole thing, that shouldn't be more than a day. Now, even for like first time, because we put a lot of time into just getting all the dimensions and this whole design just tightened out as much as we can, really tight and exact. So one day for this, one day for the plumbing, um, ideally one day for the cabinets in the kitchen, one day for the bathroom, um, bathroom system. And appliances. So that's where we're at. Questions? This is next week. We're going to build it, and we might not like maybe uh, we're going to be busy actually all next week. So we might uh, hold off the meeting. We'll, next meeting in two weeks, uh, I would suggest because we're going to be busy here with uh, about three or four people um, working next week, implementing all the stuff we talked about right now. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, and that gets so much closer to reality. Up. Yeah. Big step. Big yeah. step. Yep. So, unless there's any questions, any questions? Then we'll, we'll call, it, call it a day. I mean, well, the thing is, you guys right here who, who are involved, can you do some of this CAD or bill material stuff? I don't know. Get your friends to do it and help out. Uh, spread the video on the internet and, and let's get a team going. Otherwise, I mean, what's, what we'd like to do is do when we build every single iterative model of the house, 
we know how much time it takes to go through all the details. So in order to make this available to the public, we have to do it in large swarms of people doing this in parallel. Just like we built in five days, we want to design the whole thing. Like the level that you saw today, which took months, like that plumbing diagram there took like uh, probably two weeks, two, three weeks, full time myself doing that. Now we've got all the parts and the principles. You can do that in an hour if you, got, if you know how to do it, uh, if you break it down. So it's like, yeah, let's get like five day design sessions when a whole crew of people, a hundred or a thousand, uh, like a hundred people, you're actually making that entire design of a new house model. Like the one model, the Rosebud right now is just a two story colonial style. You can do any kind of iteration, a row house, whatever. Three, three floors, one floor, whichever you like. So uh, in order to facilitate all the different models for the future, we're thinking about, well, on one side, of course, as, as a company, as our nonprofit organization or whatever spin-offs, we're going to collaborate openly with everybody on the new designs, but we're committed to also involving the public because we want to scale up the public as much as possible uh, to promote democ democratic development across the world. So um, part of that means making technology accessible so people can survive and thrive. That's why we're trying to involve the public in this. So get involved. Do the CAD, do the bills and materials, do the build instructions. I mean, really, we should have a bunch of builders on this this uh, this call actually knocking out all the designs and builds. And we're building up to that. As, as we start building and housing, uh, these teams are going to grow. Every week it gets better. Yeah. yeah. The update just just for the world, um, which is also important, because five days negotiating inspection schedules is hard, because a place like Kansas City takes three days for an inspector to show up, so it's impossible to build in five days, because we'd be waiting three days. Um, but today I had a call with, um, as John mentioned, IBTC. It's a company that does, they actually certify uh, manufactured home builders, so they interact with code compliance, they facilitate the process, and they basically uh, told us that uh, we can get, by working with them, they can facilitate the process, um, even in a place like Kansas City. So we're seeing what we can do, but having some kind of a certification system set up that even our DIY capable build system gets the type of certifications that standard factory made like very tightly controlled homes have to uh, they can go if you have a factory and you have an exact quality controlled process you can get certified so you just pass that certification to your building officials and they don't even have to show up for inspections or, or it might be limited how many times they have to show up so working with an organization like that we hope to push that process hack that process um, as much as possible and what we envision is once enough people have built this and enough building departments have seen the building techniques it's going to become much easier and things like the the on the site inspector we might have to actually hire one through a company like IBTS to do that for us in cases where the the regulatory environment is so tight or where the inspector just takes his sweet time because they've got a thousand other buildings. It's a big city. They've got like a thousand other inspections that whole week. You don't know when the inspector might come down. So that's, that's going to be an issue in big cities. Uh, but today's conversation with the IBTS people, as I mentioned, it was very positive. You can actually watch that. It's, it's on our YouTube channel. It's um, get a more better perspective of that. So I was quite encouraged that uh, as a um, you know, public benefit Nonprofit or, or this public interest effort, we're going to tread some paths, some pioneering paths in terms of compliance, uh, hacking on the same processes that the so called big guys do in a very controlled environment. So, you know, as we get more experience with this, it's going to get easier with every build. So, that's, that's actually great news, and I'm quite encouraged. So, that even when we go to KC, uh, our current strategy was. We have to be building like two things at the same time so that when an inspector has to come to one, we're actually building on the other. But with this, um, we would facilitate that ideally making that five day promise uh, a real one for making it much more replicable. We'll, we'll pave the way in terms of the legal 
infrastructure necessary to do that. That's greatly valuable. So that five days is 36 times faster than any builder today. So that'll be worth it. And at that note of inspiration, I think <laughs> we can go and actually build the thing and prove the model this, Oct this October and November. We're going to plan on building four houses. And the biggest need, uh, if you're a general contractor, mentor us. I need a mentor to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm being the guinea pig to do this. Um, as far as leading the whole process, I've led many of the builds in terms of the swarm builds in unregulated environments. The wild <laughs> backwoods of our <laughs> facility right here in, in the rural Missouri. But as we take it into the, the mainstream world, we need to navigate the whole legal process in terms of the, the whole financial model and making sure all the procedural things come into place. So if anyone who's a general contractor is interested in helping us, uh, let me know. That's perhaps the biggest, in my just in my own psychology, when I look at it, okay, we know how to design this, we know how to build this, um, and we're trying to negotiate the codes, but as far as just the whole business model, and the experience of going through the trenches to execute a full build on a very tight schedule, that's what experienced builders can help us with right now is in terms of general contractors, the people who look at the whole build process and can assess whether what we're doing is gonna meet the ends and, and price points, uh, basically the cost structure and efficiency is gonna be there. So that's, that's what we're working out. Help us out if you're a general contractor. It's an open invitation, work with us, this is gonna go far. So this would be good for many people. If you're a general contractor, I mean, we envision a lot of builders and general contractors taking this work on once it's proven. Like right now, we're doing the proving points, the proof points, proof concept of one, the build, which we have shown that we can do it extremely rapidly in the field. Um, and now it's just proving the economic model to make this really scale. So we do envision a lot of people so if anyone who's a builder is curious, well, why should they get involved? Well, I think this, this can spread, and our goal is to open up the collaboration to everybody and uh, just create a new paradigm of collaborative economics. So that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, let's do that. We are uh, we're, so we're going to be building next week. So we'll call off the meeting for next week, and we'll come back in two weeks to review where we're yeah. at. And in the meantime, I mean, feel free to do the CAD, do the bills and materials. It's just a lot of a lot of work. It's, uh, it's just a lot of detail work. So feel free to get involved and work with us. Mm -hmm. All right. So thanks. Okay, man. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And anybody on the internet, yeah, feel free to put the comments and uh, or questions in the comments once this is published. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you to Thank you. you. Okay, bye-bye.